My text today comes at last to the final chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and we'll read the first 14 verses. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out... On land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have ca just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fifth fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And as we turn the corner, after more than a year studying this great book, we learn one more time emphatically that Jesus loves his church. Let me say that again. Jesus loves his church. And in this final chapter, we're going to take three weeks here, we're going to see the expression of the love and the welcome that Jesus has for his church, the forgiveness that he pours out upon his church, his supervision of the church that is in union with him, and how, yes, how he calls us to bear much fruit for his glory and for our blessing. So this is a special chapter of John's gospel, and it's more than just a few historical notes. Uh, one commentator calls it a pageant, a pageant of the picture of the, of the way Jesus, as the chief shepherd, cares for his church and loves her. So what do we learn here? What, what do we see as we kick off this final chapter? And I've listed four points in your outline. The first point is that it is great to be part of the resurrection church. Second point, the fruitless Christian life lived apart from him is discouraging. The third point, the fruitful Christian life is a joy when you are connected to him. And the fourth point is just so beautiful. Jesus invites you to feast with him. So let's go to point number one in the first two verses, and, and 
some of you who are, who are veterans of the Gospel of John, you know that Jesus is about to have a very personal and private conversation with Peter, intense. But here at the beginning in these first 14 verses, Jesus addresses them all, all the disciples. And as you know, the disciples in their collective capacity, they represent the church of Jesus Christ. He addresses them all. And the most important word that's jumped off the page to me is at the end of verse 2. It says at the end of verse 2, and his disciples were together. There's that word, together. Jesus wanted them to be together. You remember that after he rose from the dead, he meets the women, and he says, tell all my disciples to go up to Galilee and wait for me there together. You know, some of us think that the Christian life is like just me and Jesus. It's just me and Jesus and maybe somebody on the radio that I listen to occasionally or some devotional book. But now that Christ is risen from the dead, he delights in his people being together. And North Shore Community Church, we like that too. We appreciate that as well. It's no surprise to us that Jesus loves when his church is worshiping together praying together, learning together, repenting of our sins together, growing in our knowledge of Him and with each other, growing together. I love that about this church. I love that about Jesus. You know, um, Friday nights, Friday Night Live, If you come on this campus and you see all the teenagers sort of banging into each other and having a great time together, learning, singing, enjoying each other's company, and then the children's club downstairs, all the elementary age kids banging together in the games and scripture memory and eating pizza Jesus delights in that. On Wednesday night at our prayer meeting, we assemble in a hybrid way in the room and on Zoom, and we gather together, and the smile of Jesus is over us as we pray. And certainly, every Lord's Day, Sunday morning, like Elias and Chandia says, he says, my feet hit the ground, and I can't wait to be with my brothers and sisters of the North Shore Community Church. Jesus loves his church together. And James Boyce, in his comments on this, he says it's not only important to know that they were together, but you see the list of names, they actually took attendance. (laughs) It's not some mere administrative notice. Who's on the list? Peter, the one who denied Christ. Thomas, that rank unbeliever, the one who said, I'm done with church after Jesus was crucified and Jesus ministers to his soul and draws him back. And the sons of Zebedee, those proud men of thunder, James and John, oh my, who's on the list? Church family, it's normal people. It's struggling people like you and like me. It's not a bunch of heroes. It's just a bunch of people in whom Jesus Christ has begun a good work. And it's fascinating. It's beautiful. Because if you go all the way back several years, recorded in John chapter 1 and chapter 2, these are the same guys that were with him at the beginning, and they're still with him. And there are people sitting in this room that were in this church before I came here 20 years ago, and you are still anchors in this church. Some of you, 10 years, 15 years, 16, 17, 18 years. 
Some of you are new. Well, let me tell you who are new to our church, let me tell you, Jesus is not going to give up on you, and we're not going to give up on you, and we anticipate that you will be part of the together of this church for years to come. What a list. Do you remember in Acts chapter 2, after Pentecost, how they described the church? They dis- Luke describes the church as together. Listen to this, Acts 2, 46, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Oh, aren't you glad that he's gathered you into the body of Christ. We're not the perfect church, but we're the church God gave you. Well, how does he build his church? Well, that's what points two and three tell us, so we move on to point two, because you can imagine, it's post-resurrection, and there must still be this sense of euphoria, this joy, knowing that Jesus is risen from the dead, and they've gone to wait to see him again, but Time has passed, I don't know how much time, and even with their joy, now it's time they figure to go back to business as usual. And Peter says, I'm going fishing, and they say, we're going with you. And they strive, and they work all night, and what do they get? Nothing. And since this is a pageant, a historical parable, it's a picture of the New Testament church, we learn a very important lesson here, and that is the possibility of serving Christ in the energy of the flesh, and it's very discouraging. Bear with me. This is a spiritual lesson that I've had to learn the hard way many times, and maybe some of you have too. Working hard, but Jesus hasn't shown up yet. And the reason that I'm not imposing this on the text, it's that it's an illustration of what we learned in chapter 15, where Jesus teaches that he is the vine, and we are the branches, and that apart from him we can do, what's the next word? Nothing. Two very important lessons in John 15. First lesson is that he's appointed us to go and bear fruit. What a privilege. What a picture to bear fruit for God in this life. But the other flip side of it is he says in, at the end of chapter four, of verse 4 and verse 5, As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Here we go. Apart from me you can do nothing. And so what is pictured for us in verse 3 is that fruitless life. And it is frustrating. I don't know about you. But I, how do I put it? I've created a lot of Ishmaels in my life. Who remembers Ishmael in the Old Testament? Remember, God promised the child of the promise, but he made him wait. And um, Abraham takes matters on his own hand, in his, into his own hand. He goes to Hagar, and he makes some other son who's not the child of the promise. And what difficulty and, and problems emerge, and I, you know just because I have a clever idea or just because you have a good thought does not make it a mandate unless Jesus shows up. And so, what do we find? Yeah, they are frustrated. Listen, there's two dangers to avoid if you know this warning. The first danger, and I got this from a man named Stephen Cole, he says this, the first danger is that you 
get paralyzed. You say, well, I'm not all that spiritual, so I guess I'm not going to even try anything for Jesus. That's what Moses said when God said to Moses, go and deliver my people and speak to Pharaoh. He says, oh, no, I'm not adequate for that. Don't be paralyzed. But the second uh, danger is that you say, well, then I'll go get some training, and I'll take the journey group, and I'll, Pastor Martin will teach me the Express Your Faith course, and, um, you know, I'll be going to Faith Builders, and you get some training, as, as that's, which is a good thing, but then you begin to rely on your training. And you say, well, just because I have some methods and just because I have some training, that makes me adequate. And you fall on your face. Just because I've been to seminary does not qualify me to be a pastor or a preacher. What do I need? Well, let's jump to point number three. Turn over your outline. Because what do we need? Well, techniques and methods are no substitute for abiding in Christ. And the fruitful Christian life is a joy when you are connected to Jesus. Picking up in verse 4, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Now, you've got to understand fishermen. And we have some good fishermen in this church. Fishermen do not like to be told what to do. I mean, picture, picture me on a boat with Mike Lee. And Mike is one of the best fishermen I've ever seen. Could you picture me saying, hey, Mike, cast your, your fishing pole like this and, and, and do it over there. Now, Mike is a gentleman, all right? So, but what would, he be th- what would he be thinking if I were so presumptuous to tell him what to do? He'd be thinking, I don't want to do that. And yet, these men, professionals though they were, they were humbled by what happened that night, and I think they began to sense that something was happening. And so, the voice from afar off, says, cast your nets on the side. And they humbled themselves. And they did what the Lord said. And God gives grace to the humble. Have you learned that yet? Have you learned God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble? They humbled themselves. They stepped out and followed the Lord, even if they didn't have full comprehension. And blessing followed. And North Shore Community Church, we believe that. And there are those times when as God's uh, word is crystal clear to us, we step out and move forward in faith. But then look at how Peter responds. And this now, the the pageant uh, grows in verse 7. That disciple whom Jesus loved, that was John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. And that picture there is jumped in the water and began this dash, knee high, waist high, toward Jesus. He couldn't wait to be with Jesus. You know... Sometimes there are people who get involved in the life of the church. And then, you know what happens? Life happens. And they get on that gerbil wheel, you know, the hamster wheel? And they get going, and they get going. And the alarm clock goes off earlier than it should, and their feet hit the ground running, and they've got places to go, and people to see, and children to drive all over Long Island, and they've got deadlines to meet, and they've got bills to pay, and life becomes 
living to pay the bills. And, and, the, and the, this ardor, this love for Jesus, well, it just sort of gets lost in it all. And I don't have time for the things of God. And then Jesus calls out to them. I've seen it so many times over my 40 years. Jesus calls out to them. He says, hey, I'm here. Come be gathered with me and my people. And you know what I've heard a number of times? What I hear is, oh, no, (laughs) I couldn't do that. It's too embarrassing. I've been away so long. What will people think of me if I come back now? And oh, friends, and if you're watching online, peeking in, maybe, I just, we we miss you. We're glad this works for you, but we miss you. And we're thinking, we're richer when you're with us, and Jesus is happy when you're with us. College students. College students. Here's what happens. They go off to college and uh, I'm so proud of most of our college students. They, they find a new home church at their university or school and then they come back to us and they're back with us. But for a lot of college students, it's this unfortunate time when the sensual things of the world and the philosophies of this world overtake them and their love for Christ gets cold. And then when you call them back, they say, oh, well, I'd be a hypocrite if I came back. No, thanks, I'm not coming back. And we say to them, Jesus says, welcome. Come on back. We're just so happy to see you. Do you sense that? Christ is calling to them, and he's calling to you, whoever you are. Come back to me. Now, verses 4 through 8 are really the heart of this, where they now have seen they're fruitless without Christ, but now that they have Christ, now they are about to picture for us those who abide in Christ And John 15 comes alive because Jesus says eight times in John 15, abide in me and I in you and you shall bear much fruit. Abide, abide, abide in Christ. Never forget that phrase. How do you do that? Well, I gave you the quote in your outline by J.C. Ryle, that old preacher, uh, that old timer. What does he say? He says, to abide in Christ means to keep up a habit of constant close communion with him, to be always leaning on him, resting on him, pouring out our hearts to him, and using him as our fountain of life and strength, as our chief companion and best friend. To have his words abiding in us is to keep his sayings and precepts continually before our memories and minds and to make them the guide of our actions and the rule of our daily conduct and behavior. This is what it means to abide. And I think Jesus brought those of you within the hearing of the reading of Scripture, he brought you to hear this today. Come to me, abide in me, be with me, and be like Peter, who's a picture of the one running to Jesus. Can't wait to be with Jesus. We want this for each other. Never be ashamed, of, like, like Peter, of running to Jesus. And somebody's here And they're thinking, Pastor John, have you missed the parallel between this moment at the end of his ministry and that moment at the beginning of his ministry recorded in Luke chapter 5? Does anybody know what happened in Luke chapter 5 when the guys were out fishing all night in Luke 5? And what happens? They caught nothing, just like this. 
And Jesus says, throw your nets on the other side. And Peter says, Lord, we've caught nothing. We're professionals. We know what we're doing. But because you say so, you amateur, we'll throw the nets on the other side. And what happens? Same thing. The fish stream into the nets so much the nets begin to break. Peter says, depart from me, from me for I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Here's the lesson. What did he say? Today you're fishermen, but from now on I will make you fishers of men. North Shore Community Church, this is our commission from the Lord to be fishers of men, and that is the moment. But can you be a fisher of men unless you're abiding in Christ? You cannot. You'll catch nothing. But you, you walk with Jesus. Run to Jesus. Gather together with the people of God. Be reinforced and strengthened in your faith. And oh yes, you will bear much fruit. I heard the story this week of a man who's discipling his grandson. And his grandson gets excited about Jesus. And he talks to three of his buddies about Jesus, and they get excited, and he leads them in the sinner's prayer to receive Jesus. 11 years old, a bunch of 11-year-old boys praying to receive Jesus. The grandfather comes to me and says, do you have any extra Bibles that you can spare, Pastor John? I said, oh, I think so. Got him some Bibles, and we got him copies of the children's catechism. Grandfather takes them back to the boy. The boy puts them in his backpack immediately, jumps on his bike, pedals to his friend's house, gives them the Bible, gives them the catechism, and announces, we're going to study the Bible every week. Do you have a backpack? Do you have a Bible? I've got Bibles for you. Bear much fruit. Watch him bring in the catch. And finally, point four. Jesus invites you to feast with him because now the pageant comes to this beautiful interlude, this beautiful moment. We pick up in verse 9 and again in verse 12. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus, verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now here he is, the king of the universe. The New Testament says, the Lord of lords and king of kings. And he doesn't say, doesn't ring the bell, hey servants, go prepare. You know what he does? He supplies their need. He gives them what they need. They're hungry. They're tired. They're experiencing life, and life isn't easy, and Jesus knows your need. Do you know Philippians 4.19? I hope you have it memorized. It says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And then he enjoys a meal with them. Now this might be a surprise to some of you because some of you, when you think of Jesus, you see him engaged in battle with the Pharisees and the Sadducees in dialogue and debate. You see him late at night, out in prayer, up on the mountain. You see him in Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood for you. You see Jesus touching the leper and healing him. You watch him raise Lazarus from the dead. You are amazed at his discipleship of his disciples. And you know there's a moment in the Gospel of John, and I think I kind of hurried over it in chapter 12, where after he raises Lazarus from the dead, we are told at the beginning of chapter 12, so they gave a dinner 
for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Reclining with Jesus? Like Jesus is relaxing? (laughs) Did you see in the newspaper this morning? Aaron Judge is back in the lineup. Yeah, he homered. This food's pretty good. Martha, you are a terrific cook. I'm really enjoying it. What's the recipe? Lazarus. I'm so glad for your witness now in the community here in Bethany. He just enjoys being with his people. Jesus loved a good party. That's one thing. We're not the greatest church, but this church does know how to have a good party and to recline at table with Jesus in the sweetness of Christian fellowship. But even more, it's not Martha who serves them. Who serves this breakfast? Who prepares this breakfast? Jesus does. And he is the servant of you, his people. He serves you. This is amazing. What king do you know who lights the charcoal fire, who guts and cleans and scales the fish and cooks it up, warms the bread fresh out of the oven, says, come have breakfast. He serves, like in John 13, right? John 13, their feet stink, their feet are filthy, and Jesus takes up the towel and washes their feet. And oh, my friends, he has to wash their feet. Peter says, oh, no, don't wash my feet. Jesus says, I have to wash you. What's he talking about? He's talking about the cross. He says, you have to be washed in my blood to have the forgiveness of sins. I have to wash you. And yes, he washes them. All this for you, friend. And he's going to do it in heaven. And you say, he's going to do it in heaven? Where does the Bible teach that? And I love in Luke 12, where we read, Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service. Who will? The master will. And have them, who's them? You. Recline at table and he will come and serve them. Did you ever hear that verse? He is going to serve you in heaven. Serve what? Isaiah 25, looking at the great day of the Lord. On that mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples. He's talking about the second coming of the Lord in the new covenant age when, people, when Gentiles are brought in. A feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich few food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And I like the King James translation of Revelation 7, 17. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Jesus loves his church. Did you know that? Jesus loves us. He loves you. And he says, come. He says, hey, maybe for the first time, you'll be like Peter. Jump and run to him today. Maybe you've been on the hamster wheel doing life. And Jesus is saying to you today, hey, he's not with a frown or scolding you. He's just saying, come on back. Abide in me. Are you ready to do that today? Let's bow our hearts, our minds, our heads and present ourselves to the Lord. Lord, we are so grateful for this moment at the end of John's gospel to be reminded that apart from you, we can do nothing. But, Lord, connected to you, abiding in you, as you show up in our lives, we want to be like Peter and run back to you and thank you for the abundance of your blessing on us as we are together in Christ. We are glad for this moment. Lord, maybe some of us for the first time 
we are glad. And as we come, we see the feast of the house of Zion, that great day that is ours that we anticipate. And oh, what a feast it will be. Until then, Lord, nourish and strengthen us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.